Welcome, Inklings, to the all-new First Issues, the weekly review show where I, the archivist Bradley Nephilim, review new First Issues. These are the new number ones from the week of March 9th, 2016. Let's dive right into Marvel Comics with... Mockingbird number 1, written by Chelsea Kane, art by Case Niemczyk, and color art by Rochelle Rosenberg. Okay, quick backstory. Nick Fury used a special cocktail of Super Soldier Serum and the Infinity Formula to bring Bobby Morse back from the dead. And this issue is all about S.H.I.E.L.D. checking to see what happened with her medically because of this. In short, they turned Mockingbird away from being your standard awesome S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, and now she has powers! My verdict? I am legitimately torn. I fell in love with Mockingbird directly from her debut and from her stint in West Coast Avengers. I know the character as best as an audience member could, even when she and Clint had their falling out because of her pseudo-rapey plot thing that led to her letting the Phantom Rider die. So a book that basically goes, and now she's more like Spider-Woman because while being an awesome agent is awesome, now she has power to some extent. And I legitimately don't know what to do. The writing from Kane is actually really great, and of course the artwork is pretty good, and Rosenberg's colors really tie in to what I think the ANAD main look really is. But I love Bobby Morris as just a damn good at what she does woman. So flipping a coin, buy this book. To hell with previous notions, this is a new world and therefore shouldn't be hindered by the limitations of fanboy fervor. I know, it was a weird swerve there. Next, we have The Infinity Entity Number 1 of 4, written by Jim Starling, pencils by Alan Davis, inks by Mark Farmer, and colors by Jordan Boyd. The Infinity Entity is Adam Warlock, if you can't tell by the cover, and this book is set between two Thanos graphic novels that I've honestly never heard of, Thanos, The Infinity Relativity, and the upcoming Thanos, The Infinity Finale. Quick summary, Adam doesn't know who he is, so he goes to the classic Avengers. Classic as in even before Steve joined up with the team. He fights them, but realizes he's not in the right time, so he goes to a different time. The Avengers set back before he arrived. He poofs to the Guardians of the Galaxy circa when Star-Lord shot him, before being pulled to the in-between by the in-betweener. I know I'm trying not to spoil these books too much, compared to my last run on First Issues, but there's really not a lot to say about this. It's an interesting setup to a miniseries, but if you don't know who Adam Warlock is, then this book probably isn't for you. As for me, honestly, I feel a really big gap because I don't know what happened in the last graphic novel, but other than that, I would say if you know who Warlock is and have been missing this character, then it's probably worth checking out, but probably not until the final issue comes out. However, officially, in a vacuum, I'd say it's very, very skippable. And time for Mousevils! Haunted Mansion number 1 of 4, written by Josh Williamson, art by Jorge Colo, and stories by Jean-Francois Bellou. Sorry if I mispronounce any of that. So, Disneyland's attractions are real. Insofar as that they're real-world locations, not that, you know, everything in the park is now real in the park. A boy loses his grandpa on the Matterhorn in an avalanche, and apparently his soul is now trapped in the mansion. So Danny, the boy who lost his grandfather, must stop the evil ghost captain who's trying to make the happy haunts into evil ghosts. Yeah. Full disclosure, I know nothing about the Haunted Mansion ride itself, other than what I know from Some Jerk with a Camera and the crappy Eddie Murphy movie, so I went into this fairly green, and I was actually surprisingly enthralled with it. It's a fairly straightforward setup, but the art really does prop this story up, giving the Haunted Mansion a decent enough creepy atmosphere, though it succumbs to exposition dumping awfully quick. I'd probably have gone the route of maybe having him face his fear and break into the mansion after his grandfather died, since that's actually set up in the very beginning, without it being so much him being summoned there directly. But otherwise, it was a solid read. So I guess my verdict is, read it! Huh. I didn't think I'd say that about a Marvel licensed comic. Next comic. Now we have the Titans comic. Heroes Godsend Number 1, written by Joey Falco, with art by Roy Allen Martinez. So, Heroes is a beloved season and a half of a show that ran for four seasons, and given a sequel miniseries on NBC called Heroes Reborn. And this comic is showing the backstory of Farron Azan, the protector of the mysterious Melina in that show proper. And how's her backstory? Well, this issue deals with the 9-11 terrorist attacks and her discovering her powers, so still handled a lot better than Simon Baz's backstory. Kudos there! Heroes Reborn, the show, wasn't met as well as the original Heroes, or rather, the first season of the original Heroes, and I think some people have actually liked it better than the final season of that show. It didn't get the renewal that people thought it would. 
So, is something like a character backstory comic tie-in worth it? Well, my verdict is that this is a very niche sort of story. First off, you have to be a fan of Heroes Reborn, which, considering it's like 55% fan rating on Rotten Tomatoes, isn't exactly a great audience. Then you have to be a fan of comics, which by the numbers makes it slightly more likely. Then you have to be interested enough in the character of Farah, who in the show wasn't bad, but I don't recall anyone ever actually thinking that, oh, she's so mysterious, we definitely need to see her backstory. But, if all of that fits you, then this is actually a pretty good read, and I'd recommend it. If not, then I'd honestly say you're already bored and confused by what I've been saying, so let's move on to the next book. The next book is IDW's new gimmick event thing, The X-Files, Deviations Number 1. Written by Amy Chu, art by Elena Casagrande and Silvia Califano, and colors by Ariana Florian. So, IDW is starting this new deviation stuff, which is taking the licensed comics they have and basically doing a line of what-ifs. And this shows us the world of what if Fox Mulder was the one abducted and not his sister. Basically, it lays out the same way as it would happen in the show, though being two women, you get some douche asking for a threesome, and it may just be the writing since they really ramped to the My Brother Was Abducted relatively quick, but you can get a more understanding and camaraderie between the two, which took a season or so before it did in the show. My verdict may stem from the fact that I am an X-Files fan. I even watched it as a kid when I most certainly should not have. But this is a really unique take on the dynamic between Scully and a Mulder, but it is only the first issue, so there's still a heavy potential for what's to come, including a tease at the end about a certain fox working for the cigarette smoking man. If you got that reference, then buy this book right now. If not, then watch the show and then get behind this great IDW, get behind all the great IDW comics. Season 10 and Season 11 are on right now, and bam, it's awesome. But definitely give this book a read when you can. And also from IDW, Mars Attacks Occupation Number 1, story by John Lehman, art by Andy Kuhn, and colors by Jason Lewis. Mars Attacks really has a unique life with IDW. They've had their own ongoings a couple times, and have crossed over with a lot of people, from Popeye to Judge Dredd, and their tone has, for the most part, been kind of silly in that serious way. And this isn't that. This actually plays a Mars-occupying force fairly realistically, with tones of some of the familiar tropes. The story proper is all about Rudy Johnson, a strong and kind of aggressive woman, and her personal life under the occupation. For the most part, this issue is strictly character development for her. We get to see who she is, how she acts, and why she is how she is, and the plot lays out very well to make you really want to know how the ending of this will play into the next issue. So the writing is tight, and the art is pretty damn good. I love the bleak, stark world mixing in with her slightly more animated imagination a few times, and I'm hoping we get to see even more of that in the future. So, even if you haven't seen the bonkers Mars Attacks movie, which I highly recommend you should, it's Tim Burton doing a spoof of 50s sci-fi. Come on, it's freaking sweet. And the comics are no exception, so give it a read or a buy. I'd say a buy so you can show off that you know how strong women should be written. Zing! Now, let's go to Dark Horse Comics with... Aw oh, yeah, comics. Action Cat and Adventure Bug number one, by Art Balthazar and Franco. In my old first issue section, I covered Art Balthazar a few times, though most of you may know him for Tiny Titans. But honestly, that's not even a fraction of what his action cat stuff is. Like, a year or two ago, there was this big Crisis-style series, and it was just brilliant, being a solid story that kids and adults can get behind, and having jokes and gags that just the oeuvre of a fan and building into these sorts of jokes. And that's what we get here. Though it splits between Action Cat's story and an Adventure Bug story, both of which are fairly fun. My son, who's only two granted, really had fun with it, and he made sure that I had to get more. The art is cartoony, but it's meant to be. It's an all-ages book that, while could easily be considered strictly for younger readers, there's gems in there for the adult reading along, too. Random segue, if any listener wants to send me any all-ages slash kid-specific comics, give me a message on my Facebook page or tweet. It's for a show idea, and because Ezra loves reading and Xander, well, he's not quite one yet, so I'll give him a couple years before I let him handle my comics. I learned from my father's mistakes on that one. 
Sorry, I digress. Go and buy this right now. Even if you don't have a kid at home, you will have a smile on your face reading this comic, be it the lizard gun or the giant ladybugs. And finally, here comes the Boom Studios comic, Baker Street Peculiars number one, written by Roger Langren, art by Andy Hirsch, and colors by Frank C. Stressing. You know what I'm sick of? Sherlock Holmes adaptations. I mean, I like the small snippets of Elementary I've seen. I really do love the BBC Stephen Moffat Sherlock show. Audio dramas, Basil Rathbone, comics, TV, books, crossovers, just everything really. However, this book, this series... Okay, quick premise is that Sherlock Holmes isn't real. Duh. He's actually a creation of Mrs. Hudson, who's been the world's greatest detective this entire time. However, with how large her caseload is, she uses the young scamps of Baker Street as her arm. And this issue is about those young plucky kids and their dog solving the mystery of living statues terrorizing London in 1933. Go buy this right now. I've got nothing else to say. The writing is fun and great. Lengren has done some spectacular all-ages books in the past. Definitely check out Abigail and the Snowman or Thor the Mighty Avenger. The art style is great from Andy Hirsch. This really adds a cartoony feel to the look, but with the dull colors from stressing, adding a, well, feeling of 30s London, if that makes any sense. It just honestly is a tour de force that I think everyone, and anyone, will have a blast reading. And that's why it is my top pull for this week. Welcome back, and welcome to First Issues, where I take a look at any first issue that I haven't covered before on the show. Usually this is a viewer-chosen issue, but since this is the first time it appears on this version of the show, I'll cover a comic that has a lot of buzz around it, but I haven't read yet. That's the Mark Waid and Fiona Staple relaunch of Archie in, well, Archie number 1 from July 8th, 2015. Welcome to Riverdale High with your tour guide, or narrator at the very least, Archie. He gives us the lowdown on the current gossip around Riverdale, which is him and Betty breaking up. But that's all on the sidelines when their friends try to get them elected as homecoming king and queen, which goes as fairly wrong as what most high school dramas do. Better than those OC kids ever did. Kids still remember the OC, right? Anyways, it's fairly straightforward introduction issue to get you up to speed on who Archie is and the other kids in the hall. I know it's a fairly standard plot, but that's just the skeleton to show these characters, and it is a best foot forward sort of situation. They don't play with the trope that the Archie comics proper had accumulated over the years, but rather, Wade writes it as, for lack of better term, real as possible with maintaining a predominantly positive atmosphere. Betty and Archie may have broken up, but neither of them thinks less of the other, at least in public. But really, the biggest quandary is Jughead in this. He still loves himself some food, but this Jughead is a bit more underhanded, backhanded. I'm not. I, I don't know the. I don't know the term that I want to use for the homecoming dance. He was supposed to rig the vote so Archie would be king, so he and Betty could finally get back together. But he burned Archie's votes, and not in some whoopsie doopsie. My bad. Ha <laughs> ha. Not to mention he glues someone's hand to a steering wheel, but the characters are solid. And that art, oh man, that art. I've gushed long and hard about Fiona Staples' art when I got into Saga, and there's a good reason she's been voted number one female comic artist of all time. It oozes with color. Every panel has a flow and life to it that even when Archie's meant to look sad, doesn't go into an overly dramatic or contrasting style. Her artwork is always as close to perfect as you can get without trying to be overachievy. Of course, this series has gotten a lot of critical acclaim, and there's a good reason for it. It's a series that if you've been on the fence about or haven't bothered with, then you need to bother and just read this first issue and get hooked on a series that is both relevant and fun with characters that keep you interested all the way through. Thanks for watching. Don't miss this Thursday's Binging on Comics where I'll be uploading my old Injustice Year One episode, which is actually one of my favorite of the classic Binging on Comics. If you want to suggest a first issues for a flashback first seats, send me a tweet or message me at the Archivist Facebook page. Both links are in the description. Don't forget to click that subscribe button. If you agree or disagree with me, or if I missed a comic that you think I would have covered, then leave a comment below. At the end of the month, I will do a recap of all the comics I missed, so don't hold back. And with that, stay golden, Inklings.